Hey guys, we're going to start today by looking at these two photographs and just trying to get a sense of how they make us feel. You feeling anxious? I know I am. These cups are on the side of a table and they're just barely hanging on to the edge to the point where if someone gave them a tiny little force, they would fall straight to the ground. Um, and the reason for this is actually related to energy and the types of energies we're going to talk about today. Now, we've already talked about how energy comes in all different forms, but all of those different types of energy that we could talk about in physics actually boil down to two categories, which is kinetic energy and potential energy. So those are the two that we're going to talk about today. And specifically, we're going to be referring to mechanical energy, which means things moving around as opposed to more abstract stuff like gravity or chemical bonds. We're going to start with kinetic energy first, because that's the one that's easier to see with the human eye. Kinetic energy is defined as the energy that an object possesses due to its motion. So I'm going to show you two images here and want you to tell me which of these two uh, animals has more kinetic energy. Obviously, that's going to be the cheetah. As you probably know from your background knowledge in science, cheetahs are some of the fastest animals on the planet. And it's essentially running with more motion than the wolf is. So more motion means more kinetic energy. But now I want you to look at these two images down below. There's a girl on a bike and there's a car. They're moving at about the same speed. Which of these two has the greater kinetic energy? That would actually be the car. So what's the difference? If they're moving the same speed, is there really more motion happening in the car? Well, there's two things that matter for kinetic energy. There's velocity, which is the more obvious thing. Uh, the velocity of an object helps to determine its kinetic energy, but also mass is important. The car and the motorcycle or bike, or she's got kind of an electric bike thing going on there, uh, those two things are traveling with the same velocity, but the car has more mass. So there's more stuff that is in motion. So overall, you could say there's more motion in the car. So that's kinetic energy at a glance. How do we use the concept of kinetic energy, and how do we find out how much there is in an object? Well, it's based on those two properties, mass and velocity, that we just discussed. And the way we combine those two is in this equation. Kinetic energy is equal to one half times mass times velocity squared. Notice that velocity is squared in this equation. And what that means is that velocity is more important than mass when it comes to determining how much kinetic energy an object has. If you were to double the mass of an object, it would have twice as much kinetic energy. But if you were to double the velocity of an object, the doubling, the two, would get squared and turn into four. So you'd get four times as much kinetic energy. Now we're going to get to potential energy. Potential energy is the energy that an object possesses due to its position. So this one's a little bit more abstract. And in fact, there's a lot of different types of potential energy, and we'll end up focusing on just one. Here's an example of potential energy in general. You guys have seen archery done before, where someone pulls back the string of a bow and then releases it. Well, what are you doing? with that bow, well, you're actually adding energy to it from your own body. You're transferring the chemical energy of your body into potential energy in the bow. You know that that arrow that you've got in the bow has the potential to move, but it hasn't started to move yet. So potential energy is kind of like stored energy. It's the energy of an object that has not yet moved, but it's probably going to for some reason very soon. So the arrow has potential energy, or you could say the bow has potential energy stored up in it. And then that potential energy is released in the form of kinetic energy. So we'll talk about how potential energy can turn into kinetic energy in another part of this video. Here's another example of potential energy. If you take a spring and you pull on it to extend its length, you're adding potential energy into the spring so that if you were to release it, it would snap back to its original length. So you're providing a potential for that spring to move. Therefore, you're giving it potential energy. These are two examples of a category of potential energy called elastic potential energy because they refer to objects being able to bend and mold their shape and then go back to their original state after they're not having forces applied to them. Now, elastic potential energy is very fascinating, but it's not going to be the type of potential energy that we talk about in this class. We're going to mostly be talking about gravitational potential energy. So let's take a look at this high diver here. You can see this guy is up on a big old tower and he's looking down on the pool below him, getting ready to do a high dive. You'll notice he's actually very high up to a point that would probably be frightening to most people. 
Um, and what he's doing is he's got all this energy stored up in his body that at any moment could turn into kinetic energy, where as soon as he starts to move, his body's going to speed up and start to fall. So let's watch his descent. So right now he has no kinetic energy, but then a few moments later, he's moving really fast. So now he does have kinetic energy. Where did that kinetic energy come from? It came from the energy that he put into his own body by climbing up that tower. So let's talk about gravitational potential energy and how we can think about when there's going to be more of it or less of it. So here's the earth in a little diagram that I'm going to add a few things to. And let's say that you were to hold a tennis ball above your head. If you're on earth, what's going to happen? Well, you know that on earth, objects tend to fall towards the center of the earth. So if you release a ball above your head, it's going to hit your head. So let's now put that tennis ball really, really high up, so far away that it's about as far as the moon is or something like that. And then we release it. Same thing's actually gonna happen. The tennis ball is still gonna fall towards the earth. It's just gonna take a longer time to get there and to speed up. Um, but now let's take the same tennis ball and let's release it from a shorter distance, maybe like half the original distance away from the earth. What is the difference in potential energy between those two objects? Does one of them have more potential energy than the other? Well, the answer is yes. The higher tennis ball, the one that's farther away from the Earth, has twice the potential energy of the other one. And that's because it has more potential to speed up. Think about that high diver. If they were only a few feet off of the pool, they wouldn't be very fast by the time they hit the water. But that guy was really, really high up in the air, so he gained a lot of speed on the way down. So the higher you are, the more potential energy you have. Let's now change the scenario and switch out the tennis ball for a bowling ball. Which of these four has the most potential energy? We think of it this way. Rather than dropping a tennis ball on your head, what if you were to switch it out for a bowling ball and then drop it? There'd be a different effect, right? You'd get seriously injured probably. Uh, and that's because the bowling ball has more potential energy, which it can turn into kinetic energy and transfer energy into your body, which your body does not need extra energy like that. So out of these four, the bowling ball is going to have more potential energy, and especially the one that is higher up. So now we have four options. Let's expand that to eight options. Let's switch out the planet Earth for the planet Jupiter. You probably already know that Jupiter is a larger planet than Earth, although it's not a terrestrial planet. It's mostly gas. Uh, overall, it has a much greater mass. So its gravitational field is stronger. So now think about these eight options for tennis balls that are high up or low down or bowling balls that are high up or low down and the two different planets. Which of these eight options has the most potential energy and which of these options has the least potential energy? Think about this for five seconds and then we'll see if you were right. The maximum potential energy is going to be found in the bowling ball that's very far away from Jupiter and that's because it has the most mass the greatest amount of gravitational pull pulling it in, and it's the greatest distance away, so it has the most potential to speed up and fall down. The least potential energy out of these eight options is the tennis ball that is very close to Earth because it has the least mass, and it's on the planet with the weaker gravity, and it has less potential to fall towards the Earth and speed up. So now that we know the things that affect potential energy, let's look at how we calculate it. In this image, we can see that someone is jumping into a lake, and you know from your everyday experiences that the snapshot is what occurred just before the guy started to speed up and fall down. So you know that his potential energy is about to turn into kinetic energy. But how much potential energy does he have? Well, it's based on these three things that we just discussed. The mass of the object that's going to be in motion, the gravitational field that they are in, and on Earth that's 9.81 meters per second squared near Earth's surface, and then, of course, the height that they are. So mass, acceleration due to gravity, and height combine in this equation to calculate potential energy. Potential energy equals mass times gravity times height. So we're going to use these two formulas that we just learned in a little physics problem. A five kilogram peregrine falcon soars over an urban landscape. She flies at a velocity of 10 meters per second at a height of 60 meters above the ground. And the question is, how much kinetic energy does the falcon have? How much potential energy does the falcon have? And finally, what could she do to convert some of her potential energy into kinetic energy? So let's look at this first part of the question. How much kinetic energy does the falcon have? Kinetic energy is equal to one half times mass times velocity squared. 
what are the two variables we're going to need to plug in here, mass and velocity. So we look up to the problem, we can see that there's five kilograms for the mass, 10 meters per second for the speed, and we plug those numbers in. Now, you, you can't forget the 10 gets squared, and I've seen students in the past apply that squared in that equation to the entire formula, but it's just the velocity being squared. So one half times five times 10 squared or 100 gives us an answer of 250 joules. So the Falcon has 250 joules of kinetic energy, of motion energy. Let's now answer the second part of this question. How much potential energy does the Falcon have? Let's put the formula out there. Potential energy equals mass times gravity times height. Do we know the mass of the Falcon? Yes, it's still five kilograms like it was in the last part. Do we know the gravitational field that the Falcon is in? Well, although the Falcon isn't right on Earth's surface, it's fairly close compared to objects in outer space. So we're gonna consider gravity to be 9.81, and the height in the problem is stated as 60 meters above the ground, which is pretty high up. So potential energy equals mass, 10, times gravity, 9.81, times height, 60. And that comes out to an answer of 5,886 joules of potential energy. So those two numbers are very different. Falcons can move very quickly, um, but this particular falcon doesn't seem to have nearly as much motion energy as she does stored energy. Seems like there's a lot more potential energy right now. So the final part of this question asks, what could the falcon do to convert some of that potential energy into kinetic energy? And this isn't a calculation question. This is just physically, what should that falcon do? And the answer is move her wings. Because in order to convert kinetic energy into potential energy, you have to start falling down. And the way falcons or any bird would do this is they would just change the position of their wings so that they can aerodynamically be forced to move downward very, very quickly, going into a dive. Sometimes you'll see birds dive bomb their prey or predators that they're trying to keep away from their young. And we model our airplanes after birds and their ability to do things like this. It's very cool. So there's a really quick sample problem with the formulas of kinetic and potential energy. But one important thing that we'll have to cover as well is how those energies frequently convert into one another. So what you're seeing here is an animation of a pendulum, very simple, and it's just showing a pendulum going back and forth and back and forth. So what I want you to try to think about is where in this whole motion does the pendulum have the most amount of kinetic energy? That is the energy of motion. Does it have the most motion at the bottom? Does it have the most motion at the top on the sides? Well, it's on the bottom. That's where it's moving the most. So kinetic energy is really, really strong at the bottom. And then that energy turns into potential energy at both of the sides. So the energy is constantly changing between stored up and then being used, and then stored up and then being used, and stored up and being used over and over and over again. Here's an animation that shows us a little bit better. There's two bars on the left-hand side here that are showing the gravitational potential energy of this pendulum, and it's also showing the kinetic energy of the pendulum. And you can see, just like we were talking about with the last animation, that the kinetic energy is greatest at the bottom, and that the potential energy is greatest on the sides. Here's one more animation that shows something additional, which is that if you were to add up the kinetic and potential energy of this object, you would actually always get the same total amount of energy. So if there were 10 joules of kinetic energy and 90 joules of potential energy, then 100 would be the total, and that will actually be the total everywhere in that animation. So whether the ball is in the middle or whether it's on the sides, the total energy of both types added up will always be the same number throughout that motion. Pretty fascinating that energy always stays constant. This is a demonstration I've done with my students before, and you can find YouTube clips of physics professors and teachers doing this demonstration as well. Most famously here, Walter Lewin was an MIT professor, and you can see that he's got a bowling ball attached via a wire to the ceiling of his lecture hall. He holds up the bowling ball to his face, he releases it, and then he allows gravity to convert energy from potential energy to kinetic energy. Then on the other side, back to potential energy, then back to the bottom, kinetic energy, and then back to him for potential energy. And that wouldn't really be that interesting if he just released the ball. So what he does is he stays there and allows the ball to come back to his face, much to the horror of his students, who eventually see that the ball does not reach him. So why is he so confident that this is going to happen? Well, as soon as you release that bowling ball or any object, and you allow gravity to do what it wants with that object, it's never going to be able to reach the same height again. Ideally, hypothetically, it could reach the same height that it was released from, but it will never be able to go higher because it doesn't have enough total energy to do that. It might go to the same level, 
but it's probably going to go to lower levels every single time because of things like friction and air resistance. It's a really fascinating demonstration. Um, it also applies to things like roller coasters, which are really cool applications of physics of all different types. There was another slide that said this earlier, but objects in motion frequently convert potential energy into kinetic energy. And you can see in the animation on the right how that works in a roller coaster. At the very beginning, when you have the biggest hill of a roller coaster, the coaster has a lot of built up stored potential energy. And then when it goes down the first really big hill, it converts its potential energy into kinetic energy. So it starts moving really fast. And then every time it goes up a little hill, it starts to store up its energy again to release it later. And this keeps looping and looping and looping, and it's the constant changing of energy that actually makes it interesting to ride roller coasters. It wouldn't really be that fun to just go up one hill and down one hill and call it a day. It's the going back and forth and back and forth and twisting and turning that makes people scream and have a great time. So do you remember how in that bowling ball example, when you release the bowling ball, it never quite comes back up to the same height. It actually starts to go lower and lower and lower as time goes on because friction and air resistance decrease its ability to swing back up. Um, well, that applies to roller coasters too. And roller coasters have to be designed in a certain way or they won't work at all. And that certain way is that the coaster has to start out at the tallest altitude on the ride. Uh, it can't start any lower than the biggest hill or it won't make it up that hill. So you can see here in this animation, there's two different roller coasters and a little green uh, coaster is starting out at the very top of that ramp. And because it started out so high up, it has enough energy to make it around the loop and over those big hills. And that's when it's released from a tall height. When it's released from a medium height, you're going to see that there's not quite as much energy in the coaster. In the left animation, it has just barely enough energy, which it can convert into kinetic energy to get around that loop. And in the right animation, we can see that that cart can make it up the first hill, but it doesn't have enough stored energy to make it up the second hill, because the second hill is actually higher than where it originally started. So this is medium height. Let's go now to low height. This is going to be the least impressive coasters. Um, on the left, you can see that there's not enough energy to make it up the loop because that cart is starting out way too low. It doesn't have enough stored energy in it. And on the right, you can see we can't even make it up that first hill in the roller coaster for the same reason. So here's our final example of how we're going to see potential energy and kinetic energy work together in this class. Uh, here's a truck that's gone out to the edge of the world, or so it seems. And they're going to take a bowling ball and throw it off the edge. And we're going to try to track what happens to its types of energy inside of it as it falls. So let's assume that the bowling ball being thrown off the edge is one kilogram of mass. In reality, bowling balls are a lot more massive than that, but we're just going to make the numbers really easy for this example so that we don't have to pull out our calculators. So the bowling ball's mass is going to be one kilogram. We're going to drop it or throw it off of a cliff with a height of 30 meters from the top to the bottom where the rocks are. And just to make it super easy, we're gonna oversimplify Earth's gravitational field from 9.81, which is the number we usually use, to just 10, because that will allow us to put numbers together very easily. Here is the question, how much energy is in that bowling ball? Well, how much energy isn't really a good question because now we know there are actually two types of energy. So we should ask how much potential energy is in the bowling ball and how much kinetic energy is in the bowling ball. That's, that's a better question. So here's the formula for kinetic energy and potential energy. So first, can you figure out which type of energy it's going to have and which type it's not going to have? Well, the type it is going to have is potential energy because it's currently high up in the sky um, and it has not yet had the opportunity to speed up and gain velocity. So it's going to have no kinetic energy, but some potential energy. The equation for potential energy says mass times gravity times height. So the mass is 1, gravity is 10, height is 30. 1 times 10 times 30 equals 300. So there are 300 joules of potential energy inside that bowling ball. How much kinetic energy is there? Well, the ball hasn't had any opportunity to speed up yet. It actually takes some time for dropped objects to reach a velocity. They start out with none. So that means that velocity in the kinetic energy equation will be zero. So if V is zero, kinetic energy is also going to be zero. So there's no joules of kinetic energy in that ball at the instant that it was dropped. So let's now take this ball and let's allow it to fall down to a height of, let's say, 20 meters. Um, so it's fallen a distance of 10. How much energy is in the ball now? Well, remember, there's two types of energy, kinetic and potential. It's probably now going to have both of them, though. So this might be a more complicated part of the problem um, because it still has some height. So it's going to have potential energy. 
and it's moving, so it's going to have kinetic energy. Let's start with the easier one because we already probably know how to do potential energy. Mass times gravity times height, right? So what's the mass? 1. What's gravity? Still 10. What's the height? 20. 1 times 10 times 20 is 200 joules of potential energy. So now how much kinetic energy is in the ball? Well, if you're clever, you might have figured out that the total energy of the ball at the beginning should still equal the total energy of the ball at any other point in this journey. What was the total at the beginning? A total of 300 joules. What should be the total now? 300 joules still. So how much is left over for kinetic energy? 100 joules. So kinetic and potential always need to add up to the same total number, even as they shift from one to the other. So let's now allow the bowling ball to fall down another 10 meters. Now it's at a height of 10. Uh, and let's figure out how much energy is in the ball now. Potential energy is mass times gravity times height. So it's one kilogram times 10 meters per second squared times 10 meters. One times 10 times 10 is 100. So there's 100 joules of potential energy in that bowling ball. How much kinetic energy? Well, there's a total of 300 joules of energy in the bowling ball in total. 100 of that 300 joules is being used for potential. So the other 200 joules must be kinetic. So there's 200 joules of kinetic energy. Now, before we get to the last part of this problem, we should stop for a second and make sure that the answers we're getting are reasonable. Let's think, is it reasonable that potential energy is going from 300 to 200 to 100? I would say yes, because the height is decreasing. So the ball constantly is losing its ability to speed up. It has less potential to do stuff the lower it is. So that makes sense. Does it make sense that kinetic energy is increasing from 0 to 100 to 200 joules? I would also say yes, because the ball is speeding up. As it accelerates due to gravity, it's going to get faster and faster and faster, and faster speeds should correlate to more kinetic energy. So this seems like we're doing things the right way. So let's now finish the problem. Let's wait until the moment just before the bowling ball hits the rocks at the bottom. So we're calling that zero meters, but that really means that the ball is just above the ground, just barely, like a micrometer above the ground. So it still has all of its energy and it hasn't knocked into the ground yet. In that scenario, how much energy is in the ball? The potential energy is now going to be zero joules because when you plug in the height into that formula, it's going to be equal to zero. If height is zero, then potential energy must be zero as well when you multiply through. So then how much is left over for kinetic? All of the 300 joules. So what's the moral of the story here? What's the overall lesson that I want you to take from a problem like this? Well, it's that the total mechanical energy in a system is always conserved. If you lose one kind of energy, that means that energy went into some other type of energy. So if you lose potential, you gained kinetic. If you lose kinetic, you gain potential. And back and forth and back and forth we go, depending on what kind of system you're talking about. Like a roller coaster can do this dozens of times, whereas the bowling ball only did it once. So keep this in mind that when you lose one, you gain another. So I hope that was helpful, and I'll see you in the next video.